while you're looking that up, I'll uh, I'll show you what I've been working on. So since our our last discussion, uh, you yeah. super uh, interested me about the the knife, so I decided to oh. go ahead and make I made my own. Oh, that is lovely. That's a great yeah. Grand Hoover knife. Look at that. I, I say made. Uh, actually, I bought the blade from. Oh, let's see if I can. I there see. It. Yeah. I can't. I can't. Uh, J J Russell. Okay. So it's actually Green River Works is the name of the company. Oh, nice. And they've got this whole line of these skinning knives. Uh, and then I, I got the handle material separately. Uh, made your own? Made my own, yeah. This is actually going to be a gift for Brad. Oh, that is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, is my audio coming through okay? You're coming perfect. Okay? okay, I don't have a big mic this time because, like, it's been a heck of a day. Um. <laughs> But yeah, so, um, well, great. No, I was just uh, Googling. I couldn't remember. I just want to double check on one little fact here. Yeah. But no, yeah. So um, I'm good whenever you're good. I'm ready. So uh, in our last discussion, you uh, talked about, you know, how you have the Buffalo or the Bison program. And that's mm -hmm. something that interests me. I read Steve Rinella's book, uh, American Buffalo. And a super interesting book, if, if anyone's never read it. Uh, it goes into a lot of the history about you know, the, the, the buffalo, its natural roaming habitat, how it uh, impacted the landscape, and then how westerns, you know, spread kind of impacted their numbers. Um, so I was kind of interested to hear from you, someone who actually knows a lot more <laughs> about it than me. Yeah, well, I'm excited to be here again. Um, it, it should be fun. Yeah, um, we've got a lot of really cool stuff to talk about. And, you know, um, we do have an entire bison program, you know, talks about Native American culture on the bison. And for this, you know, kind of going broader, like we talked about and just chatting about the bison itself and um, uh, Native American culture around it in the, you know, up to the 1800s. And then also, you know, the extermination of the bison and all of that. Yeah, I haven't read the book yet, though, but it sounds, it sounds like a good one. It's good. Um, do you know who Steve Rinell is, Meteor Guy? I uh, so he's got his own uh, Netflix TV show. He's a big hunter, conservationist. Um, but he actually did a, an audio book for, he actually read the book. Uh, so I would recommend that because hearing it in his voice was really neat. Okay. Um, but the, the amount of research he went into was really That's fascinating. Crazy. Just uh, how he... Because at first he wasn't really super interested in Buffalo. It wasn't like on his radar. Um, some offhanded comment he heard somewhere got him interested. And before he knew it, he went down this rabbit hole of researching Buffalo. There's a lot to learn about it. And to, like today and how they are versus like historic, you know, historic populations. Like it's pretty cool. Like, like for example, scientists say that bison historically prior to the 1800s, prior to the middle of the 1800s, might have been about 30% larger than they are today. You know, yeah, the physical size of them. Yeah, were. physical size. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it's it. there's so much cool stuff about the bison. They're an amazing animal. Um, so quick. Are we already rolling or are we? Oh, getting, yeah, we uh, have been. You're good. <laughs> we have a whole pie, everyone. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, great. No. So then I guess we can jump right into it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry about that. I thought we were just chit chat before the show was started. Yeah. So uh, back, <laughs> back to your comment about the 30 percent larger. Yeah. Um, if for people that have never been to Northern Colorado, Wyoming, there are, so in Northern Colorado, there's actually a state managed Buffalo herd. And then there's a bison farm just outside of Cheyenne, correct? Yeah. There's Terry, Terry bison ranch. And yeah. so, so if you think about, so let's start this way then since, yeah. since we're live, I uh, let that bison. So first I want to clear up. So bison, American bison, American Buffalo, same critter. So you may have grown up learning a buffalo or grown up learning a bison, but they're the they're the same animal. And so um, it's really um, it doesn't really matter which years. The scientists use the word bison; it's their technical name. So I'm gonna use the word bison. But okay. if you're thinking about an American buffalo, it's the same exact animal. But yeah, so the history of bison is insane. If we go back before European Americans invaded the continent, so we go before European colonial expansion. Um, there were about 60 million bison on the Great Plains. We're talking up into northern Canada, down into Mexico, across the prairies. Um, their habitat is mainly prairies, plains, open, open grasslands, but you can find them in some woodland, wooded areas as well. Um, but 60 million is an insane number, an insane number. So, for example, if you counted 60 million bison and you didn't stop to eat, drink, 
to sleep. Literally, you're up 24 hours a day counting bison, one bison a second. It would take you 695 days to count them all. Whoa. Yeah. Now, the, the, then they're 2,200 pounds today. But we're going to talk about a genetic bottleneck here in a little bit, which is why they may have actually used been bigger. But today's weight, 2,200 pounds. Even if we assume they weren't bigger back then, 2,200 pounds for 60 million bison who just live in the Great Plains. That is the weight of if you added up every single human living in the entire country of the United States today, all 50 states plus, plus Puerto Rico and Guam and Virgin Islands, you add up every American and everyone living in the United States, plus every person living in Canada, plus add every person living in Mexico, plus add every person living in Australia. So if you add up the weight of everyone in Australia, the U.S., Mexico, and Canada, that's the weight of these 60 million bikes that used to live across the Great Plains. If you put them in a line head to tail, they would have wrapped around the planet four and a half times, oceans and all. So, like, these are big critters, big critters. We used to have 60 million of them, like I said, uh, during, during the, um, you know, before the European invasion of the continent. But if you cut forward just a few years, by 1884, um, scientists estimate there were only 325 bison left on the planet. So from 60 million in the 1700s, 1600s, down to 325 by 1864. So you said that the 60 million was the Great Plains. Was that their range, or did they inhabit almost every part of North America? So the the historic, according to what scientists believe, um, you can go eat all the way from, um, well, I can't really share my screen here, but mm -hmm. you can go all the way from basically northern Canada down to Mexico, and they call it like a bison belt. Um, before the European invasion, they would be far, as far east as like um, New York. Jeez. And then all the way to eastern Washington. So wow. you have them really, really far spread across. Now, they disappeared, like on the east, I'm looking at some that, by, out of Pennsylvania by 1795. They were out of Indiana by 1840, out of Georgia by 1860, out of um, Alabama by 1720, stuff like that. So while they were more east and in, into wooded areas, they... Um, pretty quickly throughout the 1700s and before started mm -hmm. being um, exterminated from those locations. So their, their removal from the landscape just kind of followed that westward expansion model. Yeah. As the white people moved east or moved west, the mm -hmm. bison started disappearing. Now, when you think about the Great Plains, now there's actually two subspecies of bison, same species, but two okay. subspecies, the wood bison, the plains bison. I'm not sure I would be able to tell the difference of them. And once again, down to 325, there's cross genetic and genetic bottlenecking. And, you know, mm -hmm. going down to 325 species, 325 individuals, that's the reason why, you know, every bison alive today is the remnant of 325 or, you know, from 325 individuals. Not as bad as some genetic bottlenecking. So, for example, black footed ferrets, uh -huh. every black footed ferret alive today is a relative, a descendant of nine ferrets really yeah nine the species was declared extinct now bison didn't get that bad uh -huh. but they were close and so that's why some scientists some scientists think that the bison could have been about 30 percent larger than they are today because you know a lot of the larger ones were hunted down mm -hmm. and it was the smaller remaining herds that, that survived but you know before we talk too much about the history i guess you want to talk a little bit about bison themselves like what's cool about them yeah, I, I think they're an amazing animal. It's, uh, I'd love to hear more about what makes them super cool. Yeah, so you can find them today in mainly open plains, some forested areas, but we know historically they would have lived in more habitats. Mm -hmm. um, they're massive, like I said, they're 2,200 pounds. Um, what's pretty cool about them is during most of the year, the females have their own herds and the males have like bachelor herds. And when a male bison is about three years old, they kind of get kicked out of their, their parents, their mom's herd, and they have to go off and join, you know, bachelor herds. But uh, you know, they're, uh, the, the moms are pretty protective of their babies. The babies can run shortly after being born. That precocial life, like opposite of humans, where just baby slugs that eat, sleep, you know, you drink and poop and scream sure. for, you know, for a long time. 
but bison are really, really active uh, shortly after being born. Um, and what's pretty cool about them is they can live um, up to 25 years in captivity, about 15 years in the wild. So pretty long lived critter. And when they're full size and healthy, they pretty much don't have a pre uh, any predators. Um, mm -hmm. Wolves, I got a wolf over there. Yeah, I know people were doing that. There's my yeah. wolf over there. But wolves are pretty much the only predator for uh, for bison once they're full grown. But even wolves tend to go for the old, the sick, the injured, the young, sure. um, going against a healthy bison. They're the largest land animal in North America. There is nothing larger than a bison in North America. Um, on the land, that is. Right. So, well, I mean, whales are bigger, but nothing on the land. Really massive. Now, one of my favorite things about them here, you can see these are bison hooves right here. Um, okay. So... They're a hoofed animal, and they walk on two toes. So if you think about your hand for all the folks at home, ignore your thumb because bison don't have thumb. But basically, they walk on two toes, and then uh, they have, uh, you know, they've evolved to walk on their middle two toes. Same thing with deer and stuff like that. And deer, you can kind of see the vestigial other toes on their foot. Mm -hmm. But deer, like cows, walk on two toes. And their hooves are basically just fingernails. So instead of our fingernails, toenails just be on the top of our fingers and toes, a bison hoof wraps around their entire toe. You can see they're hollow. Hmm. And they're just made from keratin, the same stuff our fingernails or our hair is made from. But they're really, really tough. Right. That be terrible for your sound mixing. I'm sorry. No, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but they're really, really tough. And so when you think about a bison, unlike humans that pretty much walk on the palms of our foot, um, they walk literally on their toes, which is pretty cool. It helps them stay really mobile. One of my favorite behaviors of bison is wallowing. So wallowing is when they go out to the prairies and they lay on their side. They kind of wiggle around and flop around both their sides and dust goes everywhere. There's historic bison wallows that are hundreds of years old. That grass still won't grow in these wallows. Hmm. Um, so they lay on their sides. The reason they do it is because it's scientists have different hypotheses, but one of the number one, you know, regarded hypotheses is they're killing bugs, ticks and biting flies and stuff like that. So they lay and they flatten their huge weight laying on their side, but they get dust all over them, but they also kill a lot of bugs. And, you know, they're so good at laying in these muddy and dusty, dirty wallows that plants still won't grow in these after hundreds of years of bison not being in certain areas. You can go to places where they haven't been bison for hundreds of years and still find bison wallows with no, um, with no grasses growing, which is, which is pretty awesome. That's unreal because grass is one of the most resilient things yeah. like on earth. They just compact that earth. It's almost like cement, you know, and you can just find bison, historic bison wallows. I used to live, I used to live in Manhattan, Kansas. I went to K-State. Uh, Kansas State University, and we have bison herds out there, and you can just walk around and find these bison wallows. These you research out on Kansas Prairie, um, one of the last re remaining tall grass prairies. Out here in Wyoming, we have short grass prairies, but out in Kansas in the um, Flint Hills, a lot of tall grass prairies. One of the only remaining uh, tall grass prairies left in the world. Uh, to to backtrack and talk about kind yeah. of the remnants of of buffalo history. I, there are buffalo, like mass buffalo kill sites that date back to what, like the Paleolithic area? Yeah. And so a lot of, you know, if you go back to the Paleo Indians and stuff, they were hunting bison for a long time. Um, adult, adult, spears, bows and arrows, you know, as, as the culture evolved across the Americas. Um, and the bison were one of their primary uh, food sources. The Native American people hunted them as well. If you jump forward, like the Plains culture, mm -hmm. and you know the the bison was a a um, almost like it was a culturally significant and like religious you know animal for them. A lot of their their um, celebrations and stuff relied on the bison, and they had the bison dance to celebrate good hunts and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and I'm not an expert in Native American cultures. I'll be very clear not to, you know, I we do know that Native American, as your viewers or your listeners should know, Native American culture across different time periods and different geographic areas were vastly different cultures. Right. Um, within the Plains culture of like 1700s and early 1800s, um, there were even, even though the same Plains culture, there were much, you know, a lot of different tribes and different tribes, different languages and belief structures and culture. Um, but there were some similarities in how they used the bison. And, you know, the bison was such an important part of their life. I mean, so many aspects and parts of the bison were worked into their life. 
So for example, like the hooves we talked about, yeah. hooves could be used for decorative items. Hooves could be turned into spoons. Hooves could also be boiled down and turned into glue. Um, you know, uh, bison bones. So bison bones are massive. So this right here is a big old bison leg bone. Whoa. Yeah, you know, so they're really, really big, uh, big bones. It's a leg bone. It's like a femur or a femur. I'm not sure which it is. But the bones can be used for a lot of different things. Um, one of my favorite bison bones, by the way, is this right here. You may say, what in the world is this bison bone? Well, yeah. Um, but this what is, is actually, that? This is a vertebrae. Huh? A vertebrae? Yeah. Yeah, so if you think about our vertebrae, they're pretty much that bone stacked on top of each other. Yeah. But bison have these giant humps yeah. um, over their rib cage. And so this is the spike that makes that giant bison hump on the back of the body. No kidding. Yeah. Now, that's also the attachment for, if you think about bison, they don't hibernate. They are, they're active all winter, and they have to eat grass. Bison eat grass. I mean, they're uh -huh. unlike cows who eat grass and wildflowers and pretty much anything. Bison pretty much just want to eat grass, some sedges too. But this is where the muscles that move their head attach. Oh, so okay. Bison pump is very, very strong. And so they use their giant head like a snow plow in the winter to push the snow out of the way to get to the grass at the bottom. And this is such an important adaptation for letting that muscle of their hump, you know, because if you've ever shoveled snow, it is heavy. Yeah. And so they use that muscle to push the snow out of the way to get to the grass. Because even in the middle of a giant, you know, six foot snow drift, they still have to be able to get to the grass on the bottom of it, uh, the bottom of, the, of it. But another re way, you know, talking about Native American people, the rib bones were important. Um, rib bones could be turned to rib bone, um, rib bone arrowheads. And so um, do you, everyone probably knows the Native American people of the Great Plains made stone arrowheads, but they also made bone arrowheads frequently out of bison rib bones. Mm -hmm. This right here is a bison rib bone knife. Huh. So, um, so. Uh, is that, uh, can that actually be sharpened? Yes, absolutely. So rib bones are about the right size to become a knife. And so they would cut them. They would sharpen them. Um, folks at home, you can Google rib bone knives and you can look at them. But this is a, um, you know, a Native American made rib bone knife. It has a rawhide sheath right here. So I'm going to go and put this out there. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not making Brad a rib bone knife. He can make his own. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's that what we were recording earlier. So I think you would want to be talking about your Christmas present. <laughs> uh, he already you know, knows it. But yeah, um, so uh, yeah, so so like the bones of the animal, the skin of the animal too. This right here is a par flesh, par flesh, and par flesh. Think of it like you know Native American suitcase or Native American moving box. So people of the Great Plains were nomadic people following the bison herds around, and. Um, it's a big piece of rawhide that's folded twice. It can open up and then you can fold it up twice. Um, and this is what they would use to carry um, their items from one place to the other. The women of the tribe would normally make it and normally decorate it with natural paints. Mm -hmm. But they would use this to carry food and other items around as they were live that nomadic life. What's pretty cool is, you know, side note, not really bison related, but prior to the, Euro the um, European people uh, trading horses with the Native American people, they would use dogs. They had dogs and they would carry all their stuff in what's called a dog travoy. So if you think about a teepee pole, you would take it down, put two teepee poles across the back of the dog, let the back the back ends of those drag in the dirt, mm -hmm. and then cover like the par flesh on top of that and the, the bison, the bison fur for the um, teepee. Because the teepees are made from bison, you know? Um, now, you just make from bison skin, the leather of bison. Right. Uh, once they got horses, they would use horse travois. And then teepees got huge, like 24 bison skins to make one teepee, which is insane. Jeez. Um, but they would well, you know, talk about, you know, with the uses of buffalo. I'm just, I'm listening to a book called Labyrinth of Ice. And these uh, Arctic explorers in the early 1900s were going to explore the far north Arctic. Mm -hmm. And they were still using, like, they found the best materials for their sleeping bags were buffalo fur. That was what they preferred. Yeah. So, um, you know, um, so, I guess my point is, you know, even a hundred years after the the white people started moving west, the buffalo was still being used, you know, as a superior yeah. 
material. Yeah, they would use they would use it for like the bison robes they called them. Now, mm -hmm. so if you think about tan leather, you can they could have the fur on or the fur off. It's like this, you know, they have incredibly furry, furry bodies. And so um, now in the winter, if you kill them in the winter, very, very furry bodies, they shed most of their fur off in the summer. And right. they get basically like us, you know, just mostly skin. A little bit of furry bits, but a lot of skin bits. And so if they killed them in the uh, winter, they would use them to buy some robes. And that could be like basically a blanket, like, you know, or like a coat kind of thing, a blanket, mm -hmm. to sleep in, even a mattress. It works so well that mountain men used it. We already talked about mountain men, you know. Um, yep. the Oregon Trail folks would use it for their um, – for for their sleeping as well some of them tried to bring feather mattresses but didn't really work real well and they usually end up usually trading uh mm -hmm. trading somewhere along the way for a bison rope you know because it was just much better now they also would use bison for things like native american shields now i'll be very clear this shield right here is a um, made by modern native american people in the old method so we can teach kids and, and adults about plains culture um it's considered incredibly disrespectful to show a brave shield in public um, without having the express written per, like express permission of his tribe or sure. you know if they're alive then. But um, so if you ever see a Native American uh, different than like a tomahawk or a war club or something, which is mainly a tool, um, Native American shields, which were made from bison hide, rawhide, um, they were decorated with very personal, um, uh, very personal imagery on it, oftentimes from their vision quest. Um, so looking at a brave shield, it's kind of like reading their diary or reading their dream journal. Um, so most, if you ever see, if it's a good museum, if you see a um, shield on display, uh -huh. it, they will have permission from the tribe to show that shield off. But, you know, they would, because it's just so personal, you know, it's not like a, a, a a flesher or something for scraping the skin. It's a very personal item. Right. Um, but yeah, the Native American people for hundreds of years rely on the bison, you know, for food. They ate the bison. They used their skin for teepees and, and clothes. And and um, they used the, 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 the bones for so many tools and items like that. They used the horns. They used um, the, the, the hooves. So many different parts of the bison. Um, but by the 1800s, as the European Americans started spreading across the continent, bison really started having trouble. Um, uh, so initially, the bison extermination was due to economics. People back east wanted bison robes. People back east wanted bison tongues to eat because Native American people liked eating bison tongues. So did the European people out east. But the big difference is the Native American people also ate the liver, the kidneys, the stomach, the meat, and all these other parts. You know, I know it's an old adage, and it's an old, the Native American people used every part of the bison, but it really is a true statement. I mean, they really respected the bison during this Great Plains culture and used so many parts of it for their everyday life. Whereas when the European Americans started hunting them, oftentimes they would skin them, cut the tongue out, and leave the rest of the bison to rot. Um, sometimes they just cut the tongue out and leave the entire bison to rot. So if you think about the extermination of the bison, it kind of started off as an economics thing because they would ship them back east and people wanted bison heads and they wanted bison robes and they wanted you know, tongues and all these different parts of the bison. Right. Um, and so they started off as a slaughter, but um, it quickly became a op an opportunity for warfare and kind of, you know, for lack of better words, like kind of know. the means to the end of the, the neighborhood. Yeah, America. you know, the history of the United States has a lot of really dark decisions made by our leaders throughout time. I mean, we can look at slavery, we can look at the internment of the Japanese people in World War II, but the treatment of the Native American people um, from the earliest parts of our of our of our history is another really dark period of our history. Um while the um, Native American people are getting pushed further and further west as European Americans are taking over more and more land, um, eventually the military decides that um, they are going to combat the Native American people and try to, quote, settle them, which in itself is a racist term. Sure. Um, 
by killing the way they do life. Um, there's a quote here from General Sherman. He says, um, he's in 1868. He said, as long as Buffalo are upon the Republic and uh, are upon the Republic, the Indians will go there. I think it'd be wise to invite all sportsmen of England and America there this fall for a grand Buffalo hunt and make one grand sweep of them all until the Buffalo and consequently the Indians are out from between the roads. We will have collisions and trouble. Right. And more and more native, um, uh, more and more military leaders realize the way to quote subdue the native American people worse to kill the bison. And so on one side, you have this economic slaughter, like, you know, um, commerce run rampant with no regard for the future. Capitalism at its worst. Right. The other side, you have this war brewing and these conflicts and with the Native American conflict in the war and the army starts going out and just slaughtering bison. They start telling their soldiers different places like kill the bison, kill the bison. But then, go ahead. Was there any attempt to mask that from the public? Let's say with like um, the expansion of the railroad system. Was there ever any attempt to say like, oh, we're getting rid of these buffaloes so we can build this great transcontinental railroad? Well, that is where capitalism comes in to part two. Okay. That is where, you know, I don't think they're trying to hide it. But the railroad barons and the railroad companies wanted the bison gone. It cost money to slow down. It cost money when they didn't slow down time. They hit the bison. And bison were all over the place. When it was 1868, I think. Give me two seconds to double check my date. Don't quote mm-hmm. me on that yet. I think the, the final spike in the railroad was 1869. 1869. Okay. So as the Transcontinental Railroad is completed in 1869, at that point, it kind of sealed the doom for the American bison. Um, the railroad companies would slow down along the herds and allow people just to stick guns out the window and shoot the bison, not even stopping. They would let people climb up on the roof and just shoot the bison um, until and, – and when a bison would drop their herd animal, the other bison would come over to see if they're okay. I was going to – allow- Go ahead. And just allow more and more of the extermination. Now, eventually they may get spooked. If they thought it was a predator, they may get spooked and run. But it would be a long time like Buffalo Bill Cody. He said that he killed, I think, 42,000 or something bison in his life. It's just like, it's like insane. 4,200 or 42,000. Double check my number there. My yeah. but, but he would, but he would, he claimed to have killed thousands of bison. Because he was hired to feed the railroad workers who were building the railroad. So he right. would just go out and shoot bison. And they wouldn't run. So we just shoot them over and over again. That's what I was going to say. They're one, like their defense mechanism is that big herd. It's such a big it's animal. Big. When they cluster together, yeah. a predator can't really get to them. And that's what made them so susceptible to these mass shootings. Yeah. Um, so when you mix those things together, the early capitalism where the um, – where the uh, you know, the European Americans hunting them for pelts, for tongs, leaving the rest to rot. They would then come back later and they would um, they would collect the bones and send them back east and then turn the bones into China, send the bones into fertilizer, um, into different things that would then be other parts of commerce. Um, but they just leave them to rot in the prairies. Um, they would, you know, with the army exterminating them, with the um, the railroad who had mass exterminations, um, it it really was a, a pretty poor, um, you know, uh, poor but, period the height, of history. Yeah, the height that 5,000 bison were being killed a day at the height. Before I get, to, before I forget, is there a European... Uh, equivalent to bison? There is a European bison. Um, two seconds. Um, I, I didn't know if, uh, you know, Europeans pre North American settlement had the same uh, feeling toward them as, as yeah. the westward expansion said. And I'm not, well, the problem is I don't, you know, um, there wasn't the same reliance on the bison by the people who lived there. And so I'm not an expert in European bison, so I can't, or even the European indigenous people. I, I'm not an expert sure. on that. I'm not even really an expert on, you know, all the, I mean, I know a few things, but I don't want to, I'm not a, I mean, a professor of, <laughs> right. of, you know, a Native American studies or anything. But 
you know, from what I've read is that, you know, a lot of the a lot of the hate that the European Americans had in this time period towards the bison was due to the reliance on the bison from the Native American people. And yeah. so that makes that sense. really sealed its doom. Now, if you so if you think about this history by, you know, the mid 18, uh, like what did I say, 64, I think is what I said, um, down to 325 bison, like 325 bison. Um, so there's some unlikely heroes emerged to save the bison. Um, one of them is William Hornaday. Um, William Hornaday, he was he worked at the Smithsonian Museum. He also was one of the founding um, director of the Bronx Zoo. Mm -hmm. And he had um, he had gone out and seen the thousands and thousands of bison earlier. And he came out a decade later or so, and they, they couldn't even find him. And he realized bison were going to go extinct. And so for the Smithsonian, he wanted to go out and collect full um, examples of the bison so that we can learn about them later before they're completely gone. Um, if you think about the passenger pigeon, it was another animal that did not survive. Um, European American commerce just it used. They used to say Lewis and Clark said like the bison blacked it, and you blackened the prairie, and the passenger pigeon blackened the skies. And that animal went completely extinct. Um, and but we don't have a lot of records of them because museums didn't really get specimens of them beforehand. So Hornaday goes out to save the bison, and he's appalled by you know the extermination the slaughter so he starts working he creates with other people he works with native american tribes he works with other people to create the american bison society he becomes the president of the bison society and theodore roosevelt became the honorary president of the bison society american bison society and they really work to start preserving they get they get conservation I'm, I'm i am squishing together a lot of conservation history in like 30 sure. seconds but they work with tribes to get bison out to tribes. They bring them in. He has bison on the circle of land outside the Smithsonian Museum in D.C. to teach people about it. Um, they don't survive very long because it's in a small circle of land outside the Smithsonian. But he works. He gets conservation laws passed. You know, the Teddy Roosevelt in, in Congress, Theodore Roosevelt, creates a lot of conservation laws. And between Native American leaders, Orna Day, Teddy Roosevelt, all these groups working together, they actually do the impossible and save the bison. And from 325 American bison, um, you know, at the low point, um, we currently have about 500,000 bison across um, Canada, U.S., and Mexico. About 30,000 of them are in public or tribal lands. So mm -hmm. a lot of tribes have been doing a lot of great work about bringing bison back to their, you know, uh, historic lands and their reservations and tribal lands. So we have, only have about 30,000 bison in public or tribal lands, about 500,000 total of them. Now, only about 15,000 of those 30,000 are considered wild and free ranging. 5,000 of those are in, are in Yellowstone here in Wyoming and a little right. bit in other states. But so if you think about 60 million free ranging bison thundering across the plains down to 15,000 wild and free ranging. Now, we do have 500,000 total, including like private lands and stuff, but 15,000 wild free ranging bison, according mm -hmm. to the estimates, you know, um, that's a big difference. I mean, we'll never have a day of bison roaming across the plains because we have fences and fractured, you know, land ownership laws and stuff like that. How Things about just our interstate highway system? That'd be chaos. Yeah, well, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> moose and elk are enough chaos. And oh my gosh. Much, you know, um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, this, this history of bison in this country is unfortunately a dark history where they were seen slaughtered for commerce, slaughtered because they were inconvenienced to the railroad, and slaughtered to literally subjugate the indigenous people who were here before the European people got here. Um, luckily, they didn't go extinct. Right. They're a national animal, um, national mammal, national mammal. Um, but it is... Um, and very interesting, but also relatively dark story. Oh, sure. Anytime you delve into Native American history, uh, as in regards to their interactions with white settlers, it's it's very gloomy. Uh, I think it, that part of our history gets overlooked a lot, I feel like. Uh, 
it, yeah, a lot of times, you know, it goes civil war to like World War One in our history books that we learn in schools. And my background, I want to reiterate, my background is in wildlife biology. Right now, from work going from the zoo I used to work at to the museum I work at now, I've learned a lot about some of the amazing um, history of people that historically lived here in the Great Plains and Rocky Mountain West and Wyoming specifically. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of very amazing cultures that we've had that live across time from, you know, 10,000 years ago to present day. A lot of really amazing cultures that live right here in Wyoming and the Rocky Mountains and the Great Plains. But also, you know, a lot of um, a lot of history of subjugation, um, abuse and and not following treaties too, you know, and I'm not a human history scholar. A lot of people in the museum, we have a Mandy who's here, who's our curator of collections, her degrees in, you know, Native American studies. And uh -huh. we have a whole bunch of brilliant people here that I've been able to learn from. But yeah, um, a lot of our, our human history, you know, we're a nation that tries to learn from our mistakes. And that's the best thing I can say about us is we have not always gotten it right but we try to learn from our mistakes. So the history of the bison is a great example of that. You yeah. know, people in our country realized we messed it up and we're about to lose the bison forever. And we sprang to action. Different people working together. I mean, a future president, the, you know, the Bronx Zoo and Native American tribes all working together to save a species. And it worked. Uh, were there some, were there any issues with, bringing back a population of bison from 325 individuals because that seems like to me that that there's a lot of uh ways that could go wrong with say inbreeding or i don't know what i don't know the number of that you need to have a healthy population to bring it back so and um and i'm not a geneticist but it's called genetic bottlenecking where mm -hmm. you have this big species that goes down to this little tiny bottleneck and they get big again and so um Modern geneticists, so if you talk about the black-footed ferret, for example, um, yeah. they have to trace the genetics of every individual, every black-footed ferret that was born in captivity. There's wild-born black-footed ferrets, but every black-footed ferret born in captivity, they have to trace that back to which of the two nine individuals it comes from and try to create as much genetic viability. Um, another great example of extreme genetic vi uh, bottlenecking would be the California condor. I don't, it, that was less than 20, like 18 or 19, I think, maybe 27, something like that. But less no. than 30, we'll call it, um, individuals when we got down to it. We had to take all, what, an example of the, um, the black footed ferret and the California condor is we had to take all of those individuals from the wild into captivity to keep them safe. If we had left them in the wild, they would have gone extinct. Probably. I mean, we can't tell yeah. the people, but probably. Um, so captive breeding. So we know who was born. With the bison, they were never all brought into captivity, you know? We did bring some in to keep them safe, but Yellowstone always had bison. We never lost all the Yellowstone herd. But you're very right. When you get down to a small number, genetic viability becomes very difficult. I don't know the magic number, um, but yeah, I mean, you I mean, the European royals throughout time have proven that inbreeding is not a good idea. Nope, not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> there was, in the in that book by Steve Ranella, uh, he talks about the aftermath of, of mass killing all those bison. Whenever the Plains farmers started to try to till up the land, they, they physically couldn't till the land because there were so many bones. So before they could even grow crops, they were digging up all these bones and you touched it very briefly. They started shipping these bones back East and they were making fertilizer out of the bison bones and then turning around and selling it back to the farmers. Yay. Capitalism. <laughs> um, so there's, you know, we're doing this as a, as a, as a podcast, but if your viewers there, if you just go to Google and just type in bison extermination, you will see photos of men standing in front of and on top of like, three-story tall piles of bison skulls. You'll see racks of thousands and thousands of bison robes. It was an insane time period of extermination and, 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 and I don't use the word murder, it's the right word, but just death, you know? Right. Um, it, it was, it was the, all the worst part. Capitalism's great, 
But this was all the worst parts of capitalism with no restraint or even regard for the future. And sometimes it was pure capitalism knowingly what you're doing to the native people and we're doing it because it'll negatively impact other people. Right. The other interesting thing that I thought about, um, you know, 60 million bison naturally roaming a habitat like the Great Plains. Yeah. How long do you think that that would have been viable? Could a population like that have survived on the plains infinitely if, well, if it wasn't for us intervening? So what I would say is that, remember, I say the Great Plains because in the 1800s, bison were pretty much on the Great Plains at this point. But yeah. historically, before the European invasion of the continent, they would have gone all the way like to the Pennsylvania, but a bit a bit inside New York, too. Okay. So, so a little bit more space. Um, also, there are some scientists that differ. Some scientists say it may have been as low as 30 million. You know, but still 30 million or 60 million is still a lot. Yeah. But like beaver, estimate the estimated beaver, if you remember, was 150 million beaver. In the, in the in North America, and yeah, so they're way they're way smaller. They are way smaller. Me. They are. I mean, they're pretty big, but they but are way smaller. Their but, impact on the environment's just as critical, though. Yeah, and so these bison herds, um, you know, they existed. Like any population, they probably went through peaks and valleys of like, uh, you know, depending on, you know, the fire, because back then we weren't setting fire. I mean, Native American people in the 1800s, 1700s were burning, burning prairies. But mm -hmm. if we go back thousands of years, you know, we're talking about, you know, natural fires due to lightning strikes, stuff like that. And so due to predation, due to predator, you know, disease, due to, and that was another thing that hurt the bison was all these cows coming on the native, the, the, the cat, the disease from native cows infected the bison too. But, um, you know, it may not have stayed at 60 million bison. Sometimes scientists think that that was probably at a peak actually. And then okay. naturally it may have been a little bit lower, but um, they have subsisted on the land since the ice age, you know? And so yeah. the odds are they would have been around a lot longer than, you know, if you think about 1500s, basically when the European Americans started getting to the continent in earnest, uh, you know, 300 years later, they're almost extinct. They're there for at least you know thousands of years. And 300 years later, we've, you know, kind of murdered them all. <laughs> we're not real good at taking care of the natural environment. Um, we weren't. We're getting much better. Historically, historically, yeah. we are getting much better. You know, the native, the the, um, the modern conservation movement has done wonders in our in our continent in our world. But yeah, uh, historically, we weren't always great. Yeah, you know, like you said, that's that's the whole nature of the United States. We make mistakes yeah. and we go, oh man. We probably should always do better. Yeah, <laughs> it may take it. us a long time. Like how long it took us to apologize to the Japanese um, Americans for the internment camps and the, you know, during World War II. But we all, I, I believe in my heart of hearts mm -hmm. that we always try to learn from our mistakes and do better in the yeah. future. And I think the bison is a great example of that. Yeah. And, and you know, to people that have never seen a, a buffalo, they they are an incredible animal to see. And I yes, I would I would like I would like to have a time machine and go back and see one of those huge herds that blanketed the prairie. I, that had to have been surreal. It is my hope that when I die, and I'm in the next in the afterlife, I can have basically like the Netflix of the history of the Earth. Imagine just sitting back, but but it needs to be like like you know virtual reality style uh -huh. it was like fast forwarding from dinosaur to pleistocene the ice ages to like the bison and like just fast forward to some of these amazing moments of the of the uh planet that is that is my view of an amazing afterlife sit back on the most comfortable couch ever with my friends and family and fast forward through different moments of history and yeah. see things i never could have seen Absolutely. A uh, fun little fact, uh, George Washington died before he before uh, for the first dinosaur bone was discovered. So yeah. he didn't know dinosaurs existed. Yeah. It's kind of interesting when you think like, you know, um, uh, you know, there's universities in, in England that are older that, that were founded before, you know, the Aztec and the Inca empires and stuff like that. You know, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, but people need to remember, you know, while buffalo are this cool thing to look at, they're still you know, super 
they can be a dangerous animal. I mean, it's oh, in Yellowstone all the time. Oh, people get gored at Yellowstone every year. We have like a countdown. How long before a tourist does something stupid at Yellowstone every year yeah. when it opens up? People, stay away from bison. Stay away from moose. Stay away from elk. elk. These animals will hurt you. They are massive. Yeah. And they are used to fighting off wolves. You are not as scary as a wolf. They will trample you. It's not worth the selfie. So yeah. if you come out, come to come to Wyoming. Enjoy our beautiful scenery. Come to Yellowstone. But follow the rules for staying away from critters. Grizzly bears are not teddy bears. Bison are not cows. No. Well, the the, the bison trade these days, they're treated just like a livestock animal, right? In some places, yeah. They're in um and in some, uh, you need a lot bigger fences, but there are some ranchers. If you think about the 500,000 bison we have in North American Canada, mm -hmm. only 30,000 of them are on public and tribal lands. So the other 470 are in private lands, you know, yeah. and some of them are more like Wooler Rock, for example, is um, I grew up in Oklahoma and uh, down in Pahuska, there's Wooler Rock and Pahuska, I think it's, I think it's Pahuska. Down there in Bartlesville, Pahuska area, Wooler Rock is there and they have a massive private herd of bison but they're not raised like you know they're pretty much a, a, you know i won't say the word wild but you know they're mm -hmm. they're a free ranging herd out in private lands um yeah. but there's also some that's raised on farms for or on ranches for you know the terry bison ranch they right. raise bison you can go see the bison you can eat bison burgers and eat yeah. bison steak and so um you know uh there are there are some places that are right but it takes a lot more effort to raise a bison because they are still much bigger than a cow yeah so they're they're basically traded for their meat nowadays do they do anything with their fur today oh uh, yeah so you can still get bison fur so for example you know terry bison ranch is seven miles away it's a good example mm -hmm. if you go there it's a working ranch you have a they have a restaurant there you can uh, by the way i am not sponsored by terry bison ranch <laughs> um, Terry well, Bison Ranch, if you want to sponsor us, we're we're doing a new bison exhibit upstairs. <laughs> um, so uh, they are, um, you can, they have a restaurant there, you can eat. They also, you can buy bison robes. So yeah, they are, you know, the way we view, we take it, we raise bison now, ironically, is closer to how bison would have been treated by the with the, by the Native American people. Now we're not probably eating bison stomach and bison liver and stuff like that, and we're not probably right. using their brains to um, to uh, tan hides. But yeah, we're using hides and the horns and the skulls, and you know we're using more than we ever used as European American descendants. Myself, right. uh, you know, people who are have them in ranches are using more parts of them than my descendants here in the, or my ancestors here in the country um, ever would have used historically in the 1800s. And it came full circle. Isn't that so odd? Yeah. Just like that. Oh, yeah. uh, I mean, no, they're great animals. If you oh, come yeah. to the museum, y'all, the Wyoming State Museum, we do have full-size bison here, you can see. And we have a whole cabinet full of bison parts. You can take stuff out and feel it and stuff, which is pretty cool. Super cool exhibit. Uh, the, for anyone that's never been to the Wyoming State Museum, highly recommend it. If you're ever in Cheyenne or Northern Colorado visiting, it's a free museum, right? No cost to get in. Yeah. So here's my little plug. We're 100% free. We open 9 to 4.30, Monday through Saturday, unless it's like a weird holiday. It's so like tomorrow we're closed for Veterans Day. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we're open pretty much five, six days a week, most weeks, 9 to 4.30, all of the museum was 100% free. All of our family programs are free. All of our school programs are free. If you're a school teacher listening anywhere in the world, we do 100% free virtual field trips for any school or like, you know, YMCA or whatever, um, Boys and Girls Club, free virtual field trips for anyone in the world. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Jeremy, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. It's dark yeah. outside. Uh, yeah, it's very dark here in Wyoming. It's been dark in Wyoming, though, since like 5 o'clock. Yeah. But yeah, I'm going to get some dinner and a well-deserved Dr. Pepper. But, Zach, it was lovely talking with you again. Absolutely. And please have me back. Um, I would love to chat with you more. Um, give me give my cell phone a call. We can chat about some different things we can talk about. You betcha, Jeremy. Well, thanks, everyone, listening at home. And um, I'll see you all later. Bye. Yeah. Yep, have a good one. You too.